pieces and uh, talk to you today about wines of the southern hemisphere primarily. Now before any of you jump on my back and say, but North Africa is not in the southern hemisphere and neither is Mexico, I would indicate that I've looked at a map and I'm aware of that fact, but it does uh, fit nicely to talk about Africa as a whole and then bring in Mexico along with uh, Latin America in general. So that uh, this is the general route of our tour this morning is from North Africa south to Australia and then through Latin America ending in Mexico and then Dr. Amreen will pick up the other details that uh, relate to southern Europe and the Mediterranean area when he returns. <clears throat> the area of North Africa of course includes Egypt and Egypt after all was the ancient kingdom and uh, wine was made in Egypt at least in 2000 BC. There are many uh, paintings in old tombs and various other uh, indications of the viticultural uh, production in ancient Egypt and it was considerable and not only did ancient Egypt make its own wine but it imported wine from considerable distance from uh, what's now Syria and, and uh, various other Mediterranean areas that had a surplus of wine. Uh, this is by way of introduction however not by way of continuity because it turns out that in the area south of the Mediterranean which is now largely Muslim uh, wine is uh, not appreciated and in fact is prohibited by the Muslim religion and Muhammad who uh, they date the introduction of Islam from 1622 uh, and Muhammad saw abuses due to alcohol and uh, as a part of the religion made strict uh, prohibition against the consumption of alcohol. As a consequence, the Arabic and Muslim areas of Africa and other parts of the world for that matter uh, do not consume alcoholic beverages. If they do at all, it's uh, uh, clandestine type consumption by the uh, less religious uh, members of the group. Uh, so the, the consumption in this area would tend to depend on either export, well, the production would depend on either export and uh, such local consumption as would be possible from uh, European or other uh, religious groups uh, present in the country and they're generally small. So as a consequence North Africa today particularly since the severance of uh, Algeria from France in 1962 is in a considerable state of uncertainty as to its ultimate future although it doesn't look particularly bright. When you're talking about wine production in North Africa, you must start with Algeria because by far the greatest production uh, was and to this day still is in Algeria. The French began to uh, plant heavily in Algeria starting at about 1860 and if you think of the date, uh, you can see why because this was when phylloxera became evident and uh, the French vineyards desperately needed uh, wine, the French, French consumer desperately needed wine from other parts of the world. So in as much as Algeria was under French control and had about 10,000 acres of grapes in, 19, in 1860, by 1880 it had gone to 55,000 acres and eventually in the 1950s it reached as much as a million acres of grapes and that's an awful lot of grapes. That's roughly twice as much as we have in California. Uh, more to the point perhaps in judging the impact on the severance of Algeria from France, 40% uh, of the entire workforce of Algeria was devoted to grape production and winemaking at the height of the uh, production in Algeria in the late 1950s uh, before the start of the military difficulties with France. They produced about 10% of the world's wine in North Africa and mainly in Algeria. Uh, and 90% of this was exported. So it was the only part of the world that had a really high production of wine that didn't consume a great deal of it at home. So France and Italy and other countries that produce a great deal of wine consume a great deal of wine, but that was not true in North Africa. Not only that, but on a gallonage basis, about two thirds of the entire world's exported wine came from North Africa. So that although we tend not to think much about North African wine, partly because it's seldom surfaced as North African wine, rather it's surfaced as blended material with inexpensive French wine, uh, mostly consumed in France. Uh, nevertheless, it was an important part in the world's export market for inexpensive wine. Uh, 
Not only that, but there was roughly six times the amount of wine imported into France from Algeria as all the wine exported from France. So that although we, we here think of France as a great exporting nation with regard to wine, and because of the prestigious wines that do reach here, in terms of gallonage, actually, at that time, they were uh, great, and it's still true today, because the imports have shifted to Italy and other places, they're still an importing country in net balance. Maybe not in dollars, but in, in gallons, that's certainly so. By 1959, the production of wine in Algeria was roughly three times California's uh, at about 400 million gallons per year, three times California at that time. We've come up some since then, so it'd be at least twice the present consumption. The uh, production in not only Algeria, but Morocco and Tunisia, the associated countries, uh, associated geographically, uh, the production is largely confined to the coastal uh, plain or coastal foothills near the Mediterranean and the foothills of the Atlas Mountains. And uh, one thing I might tell you, some of you are thinking of traveling to Europe perhaps this summer or traveling somewhere this summer. A good idea, in my opinion, if you like uh, California type weather, is to look where grapes are grown because wherever the European wine grape does well, it's a pretty nice place for people too. And uh, this is uh, perhaps indicates that North Africa is a lot nicer, at least near the Mediterranean, than most of us who haven't been there uh, probably think of it. And it turns out that in fact, there are cooler areas in Algeria and before the French separation, there were 12 areas in Algeria that were given the VDQS, the type of uh, superior uh, wine uh, designation. So they weren't quite up to uh, Appalachian Control A status, but they were up to the uh, VDQS type of uh, superior wine of a delimited uh, district type. Uh, what's happened to these since the separation from France, I don't know. At least the quality, no doubt, has remained better but whether or not they are still trying to sell under this kind of control or remain as carefully controlled, I'm not certain. The purpose of the wine from the French viewpoint, and after all, they were the overseers and the uh, initiators and the technical experts for this whole industry, uh, was to, the purpose was to produce wine for blending in France. And so what they produced was generally 12 to 15% alcohol wine, table wine, for blending with the low alcohol wines of the Midi, which are often nine to 11 percent alcohol, uh, particularly during the phylloxera period when uh, before grafting was extensive, the Midi wines were very poor in alcohol and hardly able to be kept, much less uh, shipped and drunk uh, satisfactorily. So there was a great need for these high, high alcohol, relatively soft, relatively early maturing type wines from a tab table wines to blend with these ordinary wines from south of France. The production was largely red and yard largely with high yielding grape varieties such as Carignan, Alicante Boucher, Grenache, and in the case of white, say Claret Blanche and others like it. So they were vinifera varieties. Uh, in fact, Alicante Boucher, which you may not, I don't remember whether you've heard of that before or not. It's one of these red juice grapes, a Tinturier type and it was popular in the United States during Prohibition because you could make a lot of red juice from it and then make home wine. So that Alicante Boucher, in fact, was developed for the, it was de deliberately bred to be used in Algeria uh, for production of very red uh, in, in face of rather hot weather uh, and high alcohol uh, wines of the table wine type. The uh, export has been hard to determine since the 1962 uh, period. For a while, France did agree to take uh, wine from Algeria, knowing full well that if they didn't, the, not only their industry would suffer, but the Algerians would suffer considerably. Uh, just what the gallonage of this trade is, I haven't been able to determine. There don't seem to be readily obtainable figures on this, but clearly it is declining, and with the European common market, uh, becoming more and more enclosed. Uh, the uh, Italian and Spanish production of uh, um, similar blending wines for use in cooler areas like Germany, uh, France, and so forth has uh, limited the market that Algeria can develop. Uh, partly due to political ties, they have increased export to Russia and they have also exported some to Germany and other areas. So their export trade does continue, and they've been exporting to the 
former French Franc areas of Africa, as they always have for that matter, such places as Madagascar, Senegal, Chad, and what used to be called the Ivory Coast. I can't keep up with all the, uh, all the names, I'm afraid. Uh, so that still the industry survives. It has been a relatively modern industry, but with all or nearly all the French gone, you can realize their trouble. Dr. Guyman, for instance, has visited there, and he was remarking on visiting a rather large and at least uh, somewhat run down now, but at one time very modern winery with a large distillery, and one of their prime products was rosé wine. Rosés are uh, often an uh, important product in this part of the world, which seems a little hard to understand considering the weather. And he said it, the rosé wines weren't bad at all, but uh, when the wine master was showing him through, uh, he said he'd like to taste some of the wines, and uh, they said that could be arranged, so they had the wines displayed, and he, uh, he said, well, I think this has such and such a feature. What do you think? And they, oh, well, I'm sorry, but uh, I'm a Muslim. I can't touch it. So you imagine having a winery where the man in charge is forbidden and, and sticks to the prohibition against even tasting the wine. Clearly, it's difficult to maintain high standards of production if you just uh, have that much antipathy to the product and refuse to taste it. The industry in Tunisia is rather similar, perhaps less modern and a good deal smaller. They do have very little local trade. At one time, they had a rather, not too long ago, a rather famous muscatel. And again, if you go into ancient history, Carthage uh, is in, uh, in Tunisia. I mean, the, the former Carthage is in what is now Tunisia. And the first uh, viticultural classic publication was a man by the name of Mago of Carthage. So that uh, clearly they have uh, shrunk to small stature considering their illustrious past. Morocco is slightly different in that it was developed later, generally after World War II by the French. Uh, it, it has been uh, independent or more nearly independent longer. It has a larger European colony. There's about a million Europeans still in Morocco and the Moroccans haven't uh, uh, been as antagonistic and haven't forced the Europeans out as much as some of the other countries have. So they do have some important local consumption. They have perhaps slightly better weather, at least they have uh, capitalized better on their uh, weather conditions. So they do have generally a slightly higher quality of wine. They make a particularly interesting van gris from the French terminology, which literally means gray wine, but a gray wine in the French terminology, and how they arrive at this, I don't know, is a wine made as if it were white from red grapes. So it's very, very faintly pink or slightly brown, depending on which state uh, you look at it. Uh, but uh, there is a very uh, well-reputed, uh, rather crisp and fairly tart uh, Van Gris made in Morocco that is uh, generally rather appreciated, but seldom exported and most of their consumption is for the Europeans that, most of their production is for the Europeans that remain in Morocco. And this leaves us with Egypt, which has now a very tiny industry, having uh, descended, in my view, from the ancient Egyptian production of considerable wine. Uh, probably their best wines are Muscatel types. Uh, the only winery that remains in Egypt, to my knowledge, uh, is uh, a winery that's owned by the family of a girl who used to work for me who took this class. In fact, she was a paper grader for Vid3 at one time, uh, Miss, uh, now Mrs. Sullivan, but her maiden name was uh, Randopulo, a Greek family that managed the, uh, the only winery I'm aware of still existing in Egypt. So that there is some continuity with this class. And I have tasted some of the wines courtesy of her bringing them from uh, trips back home. But this means then that the North African industry, although large, is aimed at lower quality for export to blend, not to be sold in, in recognizable form. And as a consequence, it's difficult for you, if not impossible, to find a bottle of North African wine. And the future of the industry seems very, very doubtful, not only due to political difficulties and the severance from European connection, but also from the Muslim uh, religious influence. Then jumping all the way to the other end of the continent, from North Africa to South Africa, we have a completely different circumstance. And uh, particularly, I would like to say one word or two about the Southern Hemisphere. Now, having crossed the equator, we're in the Southern Hemisphere, and most of the rest of the morning's discussion, till we get to Mexico, we'll be doing with, dealing with the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, 
Now, those of us who are raised in, in the northern, northern hemisphere uh, may not have thought about it, uh, quite the, difference, the degree of difference when you go to the southern hemisphere. Now, first of all, we tend to think as you go north, it gets cold. But of course, in the southern hemisphere, as you go south, it gets cold because the south pole is on the southern end. So that uh, if you think of San Diego as warm and you come north, you're, you're, you're going to get cooler. Uh, that's fine, but if you think of, of Cape Town, which is about the same southern latitude as San Diego uh, and is practically hanging out in the ocean, so that Cape Town is the most polar part of South Africa, and then anything further is becoming more equator equatorial. And the only reason that you, know, you visualize, if we go south from San Diego, we get into pretty hot grape country, and we generally say it isn't terribly, uh, uh, terribly suitable. Well, while I'm on the point, in the case of Cape Town, the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean meet very near Cape Town, and the Atlantic is very cold, and the Indian is rather warm, and the two come together to make a, a very equitable climate. And uh, I spent six months in the vicinity of Cape Town, and uh, weather-wise and geographically, it's uh, hard to imagine a nicer place. I thought California was great. But for instance, in the vicinity of Cape Town, you can have commercial peach orchards uh, and uh, papaya and banana production, maybe not commercially, but satisfactory in your garden. So you can grow everything Hawaii can grow, and you can also grow about everything that Northern California can grow. And I've never seen any other place that this is possible. So th there may be a few, but it's a pretty select type situation. As a consequence, the uh, immigrants to the Cape of Good Hope uh, were uh, a very uh, fortunate uh, climatically. Anyway, then to continue our analogy with uh, the southern hemisphere, then remembering that south gets colder and north gets warmer, uh, another thing that you may not have thought about is that seasons are directly opposite. And uh, Jan van Riebeck, who was the colonist from the Dutch East Indi India Company, who first uh, started farming operations in a permanent colony in Cape Colony, or what is now uh, South Africa, Cape Province, recorded in his journal that the first wine made in the Cape was made on the 2nd of February, 1659. Now, the idea of making wine on the 2nd of February brings you up pretty short if you're a Californian. And yet, on the other hand, this is a great advantage. And one of the ideas I've been trying to tout is that we ought to work out an arrangement where uh, a lot of us that are interested in the wine business work in California in, say, August, September, October, and then pick up and move to either Australia, Chile, or South Africa and work through uh, February and March and April uh, down there making wine. I couldn't think of a nicer arrangement. You'd have perpetual summer and uh, really nice uh, conditions, particularly if you like hot weather. So that uh, so far I haven't been able to swing that, but nevertheless there are some important advantages of cooperation between northern and southern hemispheres because uh, you can get, if you're interested in studying crops, doing research on them, say, clearly you can get two crops a year this way. You can study one in the northern hemisphere and another one in the six months later, uh, not a whole year later, in, in the southern hemisphere. And uh, this sort of cooperation is growing and we have a great deal in common uh, between particularly South Africa, Australia, and California, because first of all, a common language. Although the South Africans speak Afrikaans and English, uh, every high school graduate must speak both well in order to uh, uh, graduate, so that uh, certainly you have no trouble there with English. And uh, uh, we have a little trouble in Australia. That's partly because I know we have an Australian in the audience. But uh, as long as you know that uh, mile means male and a few things like that, uh, uh, you get along fine in Australia, too. The uh, English common bond is important. The opportunity for two seasons would be important. And then we have a lot in common in other ways. For instance, in South Africa, as is the case here, they have a large percentage of the population that is not very well acquainted with wine. The so-called Transvaler, the man that lives around Johannesburg in the, in the gold mines and so forth, is a beer drinker, largely, and he doesn't know very much about wine. Well, the same thing has been largely true here. A great percentage of, uh, a larger percentage even of our population up to quite recently had very little knowledge of wine and even yet uh, certain parts of the country are pretty uh, uninformed with regard to wine. And Australia is somewhat similar, heavy beer drinkers and uh, uh, becoming much more interested in wine uh, in spite of a long history up till fairly recently, very low per capita consumption of wine uh, and uh, rather similar 
situation. Still another similarity is that all three of us, up till quite recently at least, were based on dessert wine and brandy production rather than table wine. And in all three instances, the shift is going rapidly toward table wine and away from, at least in internal consumption, away from dessert wines uh, and uh, uh, brandy. So for these reasons, uh, Australia and South Africa, representatives of the Southern Hemisphere, and except for language and so on, some other uh, similar relationships with Chile and Argentina are something that we should uh, cultivate, I think, and, and have a, we have a great deal in common, and this is generally recognized. There is a great spirit of cooperation between uh, these areas, or among these areas. Coming back to South Africa itself, as I say, the first wine was made in 1659, and the first vineyards were fortunate to be planted uh, very near uh, the site, what has turned out to be one of the most famous, uh, probably the only famous wine in, say, the 1800s outside of Europe. The Constantia Vineyard still exists. And it's on the side, on the slope of Table Mountain. And if uh, uh, it's easy for me to get uh, uh, poetic about uh, ge geography and so on, I won't go into the politics in South Africa, but uh, Table Mountain is a beautiful thing, seen particularly from across the bay. You see the Cape Town spread out below it, and it's a flat top mesa-type mountain with two little points on either one on either end and they often speak of it wearing its tablecloth because the clouds tend to roll in and sort of uh, come down the edge and then dissipate as it gets down where it's warmer. So on a pretty sunny day when Table Mountain's wearing its tablecloth, it's, it's really a beautiful scene. And up on the side of Table Mountain is where uh, the Constantia Vineyard was located. Very high priced land today and it can't compete. It's gone urban just as in a lot of other places, but this particular vineyard has been maintained as a monument and the winery still is operated by the government and some of the best wines of South Africa can be bought at this winery because they use this as a way of introducing new and high quality and special uh, wines to the public and a, a very uh, broad-minded and, and uh, uh, long-sighted uh, as opposed to short-sighted uh, operation as far as I'm concerned in that uh, it does serve as a way to introduce uh, for instance 100 percent Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon varietal to South Africa. The acreage is small of Cabernet in South Africa and as far as I'm aware it's the only really uh, full uh, Cabernet that, that I was able to obtain is obtainable from the Constantia Vineyard. The wine made at Constantia and called Constantia was, in fact, the name of the farm is Groot, or Groot if you would pronounce it, uh, meaning Great Constantia. And uh, you may have heard of Groot Skier, the, the hospital where Christian Bernard did the first heart transplant. That means literally big barn. So if you went to a hospital called Big Barn, I'm not so sure you would uh, think it was too great, but it is a beautiful big modern hospital. In any case, uh, uh, great Constantia uh, is still operated and the wine was called Constantia and it was very famous in Europe. Apparently there is some argument about this wine because it doesn't, dis it doesn't exist anymore. It disappeared about 1850 very suddenly and uh, why it disappeared is subject to debate. Even the South Africans don't uh, uh, agree on what happened. Uh, in fact there isn't even a great certainty as to what the wine was like. It was a rather alcoholic, sweet, muscat flavored wine as best as we, best we can find out. However, the, uh, at least according to some people, it was not fortified. It was sweet because it was made from very, very ripe, small buried grapes that were particularly adapted to this kind of production and muscat flavored because they had a muscat flavor. The present grapes that seem to be indicated are a variety that they call Hanaput in South Africa. It's a pink variety uh, very closely related to Muscat of Alexandria so that apparently it was a light pink Muscat flavored wine that was quite sweet. Uh, Dr. Amrine thinks it disappeared probably because of uh, bacterial infection particularly one that we have come to know here as Fresno mold because in 1936 we had a serious attack in dessert wines made in the Fresno area of a similar lactobacillus. It's not a mold at all it's a lactobacillus trichodes. Uh, this particular organism will stand very high alcohol and grow in the bottled wine and it makes uh, lumps that look something like a Q-tip swab that got loose in the bottle, so obviously you wouldn't want to drink it. Uh, 
so that this may be the reason, at least that's a possible uh, story. I suspect there may be other factors. For instance, the fact that it was not fortified and required very sweet grapes probably was, uh, uh, it became so popular and so much in demand and a rather high price. Napoleon liked it and a number of famous personages were uh, very great devotees of Constantia. Probably overproduction led to the, down, the decrease of the sugar and then having less sugar, it probably spoiled badly uh, so that the two things may be associated. In any case, it did disappear very suddenly and we don't really have the final answer as to why. Now, not only did South Africa get its start then from the Dutch East India Company, which was from Holland uh, in 1659, actually the colony started in 1652 and was maintained largely as a shipping uh, site originally. The idea was to uh, supply uh, food and provisions for ships on the way to Java and the Dutch East Indies. Uh, but it became important in its own right uh, rather soon. And the uh, French uh, immigrants that came in uh, about 1685, uh, due to uh, turmoil in France, the Huguenot, uh, not phylloxera in this case, but uh, immigration, added to the prestige and quality and particularly the interest in, in wine. Uh, another point of considerable interest is that uh, uh, I've read the statement, and I have no reason to doubt it, that the Dutch were the best gardeners in Europe, may still be. And if you think of tulips and a number of other things, it seems quite reasonable. So if you uh, have the Boer farmer, uh, and that's a redundant because Boer means farmer, but if you have the Dutch farmers and the French winemakers put together, then it would be quite reasonable that you'd have an excellent wine industry, and that's so. They have two general areas of production, the coastal region near Cape Town and uh, outside the mountains, and the coastal region extends rather far inland without any major mountains. Uh, uh, Stellenbosch, for instance, is roughly 30 miles inland from Cape Town, and Stellenbosch is a town you ought to visit if you get a chance. It's like Davis combined with Boston, I would say, because it was the second oldest town in, uh, in South Africa, beautiful little place, has uh, irrigation creeks running down the uh, side of each street, uh, some of the older streets, lovely old Dutch homes, and it is the agricultural school of South Africa. Unfortunately, they teach in Afrikaans, which makes it a little tough on the English-speaking people, but uh, it is a lovely town and makes you think of Davis, uh, except they have uh, European oaks instead of cork oaks and, and lovely old buildings that we don't have. In any case, uh, uh, this area then, inland to the mountains, uh, is the table wine producing, relatively cool region. Then across the mountains, and the mountains are not ranges as we're used to, but rather an odd mountain here and an odd mountain there. But as you get beyond the mountains, you get into a district they call the Little Karoo. I don't know quite what the name means, but translated as desert, because it looks much like Nevada, except it's a lot more... Uh, uh, more plants grow there, more different kinds of cactus and what have you, and rather unique plants that uh, are very interesting to look at. But in any case, uh, the dessert wines and brandy then are made in the hotter inland area, which is north of Cape Town and across the mountains. The grape varieties are interesting because this uh, long history, uh, roughly 100 years longer in, in South Africa than in California, for example, uh, they have, uh, well, a hundred years longer in, in the absolute sense, a hundred years earlier than our uh, mission fathers, but almost 200 years longer than our real commercial production, you see, which didn't really begin until the gold rush time. And theirs has continued fairly uh, uniformly. With this long history and some isolation, they've developed varieties of their own. So most of their varieties are not exactly the same, even when they bear similar names or similar attributes to other well-known varieties. For instance, one of their major, the, their single major variety is Stein, S-T-E-I-N, uh, and it is, is uh, uh, not like any other grape grown anywhere else. It makes a wine that reminds you of Chenin Blanc, uh, but other than that, it's hard to say too much about it. It's a pretty, pretty acid grape. It does hold up well and, and ripen early, even in fairly warm countries, warm districts. Uh, they also grow a good deal of Palomino, which they call white French, particularly for the sherries and the brandies. They have a Riesling, which tastes somewhat like uh, uh, German Riesling, but is quite a different grape, a much larger berry and so forth. They have a grape that, grape that they call the green grape, 
And interestingly enough, they have a red variety of the green grape, so they call it the red green grape. And I was teasing them once and said if it was underripe, I assume that'd be a green red green grape, but uh, they didn't think that was too funny. In any way, uh, they have the green grape, which is much like Semillon, but sufficiently different that you can uh, tell them apart. And the Hanaput muscat I've already mentioned. These are all white. Among the reds, their main grape, they call Hermitage, but you should remember it as Cinso, because that's the proper French name. And Cinso is a very bad grape in many ways, something like Mission. It yields beautifully but it's very low in red color. So when they make red wine from Cinso, and most of the red grapes are Cinso, they must drain away a certain amount of the free run and use that for brandy and what have you, and then ferment the rest of the skins uh, to get a more, uh, more uh, concentrated red color by having less juice. They make a great deal of excellent white table wine by cool fermentation and modern technology. And uh, this is slightly contrary to what the book says. The technology of South Africa today is uh, quite good, and in many respects, we can uh, learn things from them. Uh, their wine is largely made by what are called cooperatives, grower cooperatives that own the wineries. Some wine, particularly that sold to the public, is made or purchased from co-ops and marketed by groups they call merchants and then they have some estate wineries and the KWV. I won't bother to give you the full name, but the KWV stands for a Cooperative Wine Growers Group, uh, is uh, uh, the way you would translate the name, and in Afrikaans. Uh, the KWV is a government organization and of considerable importance, but it doesn't market things within South Africa. It's concerned with export only so that the internal market is by estate wineries, which are very few, uh, merchants, and the merchants buy bulk wine largely from co-op wineries plus what they make themselves. Now the wines are generally, as I say, excellent, particularly the white table wines, but they're not nearly as diverse as ours, so that you have great difficulty in telling one winery's product from another. They're all excellent, they're all light, fresh, fruity, wines, there is a sweet type and a dry type, and that's about it. Even though two varieties, Riesling and Stien, are, are largely used, they usually market the uh, uh, Stien as uh, sweet and the Riesling as dry, so that even there you have some trouble telling them apart except on the basis of sugar. Nevertheless, they're extremely good value, and we've had a habit to say in California that uh, the Americans get the best variety, best uh, quality of wine for the least money. Well, that isn't so, I don't think. If you look at the world as a whole, at least it's no longer so. Our prices have gone up so much. When I was there, and I was two devaluations and so on, I'm not quite sure what it would be today. But when I was there, you could get an excellent, the best quality wine that you could find uh, of, of a light white table wine type for 36 American cents a bottle, retail. And that's not exactly comparable with the United States situation. Of course, if you wanted to buy some foreign wines, they were very expensive and rather hard to find. Uh, and the red wines, generally, partly because the main production is from Cinso, uh, were pleasant, uh, rather soft and well matured, maybe, but not nearly as diverse and as high quality in the extreme. That is, the, the very best were not as high quality as our very best, I would say. They do have a few interesting uh, grapes that we could make use of. For instance, they have a variety they developed there called Pinotage, which was a cross between Pinot Noir and what they call Hermitage or the Cinso. Very high yielding, yet with a Pinot type flavor. And it seems to me we might very well make use of it for Beaujolais type, very light red, fresh picnic wines. And they do grow the Shiraz, the same grape that's important in Australia, much like our Petite Syrah, uh, which is uh, perhaps deserves to be more important here. They do have the others like Cabernet Sauvignon, but smaller acreage. They make a great deal of dessert wine and brandy, and up till quite recently, a, more than half of the wine was distilled for brandy, either to make into dessert wine or for beverage brandy. The dessert wines, ports, uh, Sherries uh, were, were and are excellent quality. The sherries tend to be made in the Spanish style with floor and with long aging so that they're more amontillado than anything else. I'm not sure whether you've talked yet about Spanish sherries, but if, if you haven't, you'll hear that word again. Uh, 
so that the sherries and ports are excellent. And in the KWV cellars in Paro, they have nine years total supply of dessert wines when I was there. And, and I think it may be higher now because they're having more trouble export. That means clearly that the wines can be nine years old without any trouble. In other words, they, if they sold wine at the same rate they are now and didn't make any more for nine years, they wouldn't run out till the nine years was up. So they have tremendous stocks of wine and they're worried about this. They have perhaps too much stock of wine. And part of the reason is then with England going into the common market and aiming in that direction for some time and with the political uh, embargoes and so forth against South Africa, it's been increasingly difficult for them to export their wine. Uh, disregarding the political aspects, that's rather too bad because they have lovely wines and it would certainly be nice to be able to export them. If I didn't have to worry about uh, possible uh, political problems, if I could get the market for the, the license to import South African wines, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't uh, have to lecture for a living uh, after a few years because they're very good and inexpensive from our viewpoint. The brandy is generally produced in pot stills and is well aged in uh, cooperage, wooden cooperage, largely from, uh, at least currently, largely from Europe. Uh, they have bought over the years a lot of American oak cooperage, and so some is used, but I understand mostly for brandy, uh, for uh, dessert wine, and the brandy is mainly produced in the cognac style then. And they do make a few other interesting things. For instance, they make a liqueur called Funderhum, or Vanderhum, if you're, uh, going to use the American uh, pronunciation, made from tangerine peels, and it's a tangerine-flavored uh, brandy is what it amounts to. Uh, all of their liquors, or nearly all, are made from grape spirit base, so that gin, uh, vodka, and uh, many such products, including a lot of perfume, are made with a grape brandy base in South Africa, partly because there is a strong political lobby and the uh, great business has had uh, great importance in South Africa and the KWV was set up to control uh, overproduction. That being so, then they were charged with exporting wine and they have a very great degree of control. For instance, you can't just go plant grapes. You have to buy land or own land that has a quota and the quota is established by the KWV. Recently they've been expanding the quotas because table wine consumption within the country has been going up. But uh, uh, if you don't own a grape quota with the land, then you cannot plant grapes, or if you do, you can't sell the product. Uh, and uh, they do control not only the planting thereby, but they also control the uh, price or the minimum price so that they set before the season starts every year a minimum price as to so much they'll pay uh, per leaguer of wine. And the leaguer they use is, an, is a unit not used anywhere else, but a very practical unit in that a leaguer is the amount of wine you can get from a ton of grapes. So that uh, uh, they figure it is 120 gallons, which means there's a kind of an old fashioned figure. We can get more than that today, as you well know. But in any case, they'll price the leaguer of wine at 40 rand, which is their money unit uh, before the season starts. And so you know how much you can sell your wine for. And then if it's better than that, you may get more, but at least you won't sell it for less. And they also uh, set the percentage that's distilled versus the percentage that's left is what they call good wine. So they make two kinds of wine on the farms that make wine and on the co-op typically, good wine and distilling wine. And the good wine goes into beverage and the distilling wine obviously to distilling. Well, I could spend a lot of time talking about South Africa since I know more about it and, and I'm quite interested in it, but uh, let's go on to Australia. Australia has a very long history and quite interesting parallels with California. I believe you haven't yet talked about California, but the first vines were planted in Australia, in, according to the records, in 1788, which is pretty close to the first vine planting in California. And the first commercial vineyard that can be so considered in the modern sense was planted in 1820 by a man by the name of MacArthur. And uh, 1820 isn't too far from our gold rush period, so that uh, the history does date-wise parallel rather closely. Interestingly enough, MacArthur was uh, enabled to be a successful grape grower largely because he had a big uh, running battle with Captain Bly of uh, Bounty fame, who was then governor of Australia, or at least that part of Australia. And MacArthur was more or less exiled because uh, Bly was an implacable enemy, apparently. And during his uh, period of exile, he uh, 
not politically exiled, but personally, he decided it would be better to leave the country. While he was away, he spent time studying in France and learned about grapes and wine and brought back cuttings, so that indirectly it was a good thing, I guess. And uh, MacArthur, although he didn't make quite as big a splash as a man by the name of Busby, uh, Busby in 1830 planted uh, vineyards in the Hunter River Valley, which even today is one of the uh, most important areas of Australia for uh, wine production. Busby published three books. He imported 600 varieties, and we might equate Busby with uh, Harris that you'll be hearing more about in connection with California. So again, the parallels seem uh, quite interesting. Uh, there are some differences. In Australia, many wineries are in existence and in some cases held by the same families uh, for, uh, that have been in existence and production for a hundred years or more. And that's generally not so, of course, in California for prohibition reasons, if nothing else. So that uh, uh, they have a, a history of continuity in the ownership of wineries and because of this continuity, interest in maintaining quality and brand character and so forth uh, that's greater than uh, we have been able to develop or have history has allowed us to develop. Uh, they produce of the order of 75 million gallons, I believe these figures may be out of date, but say roughly uh, half the size of the California industry. And it is growing rapidly. They're having a boom uh, somewhat equivalent to ours with planting in new areas. Uh, if I were to characterize the Australian grape industry, uh, I would have to say that uh, you may not always think of this, but the grape industry tends to be somewhat scattered, even in California. I mean, if you think, if you go to the Napa Valley, you won't see vineyards everywhere. You'll see vineyards localized within the Napa Valley. You go to Fresno, you'll see larger areas, but again, somewhat localized. And if you look at a map of Australia with big daubs of red where the grapes are, it looks like quite a bit. But if you actually start planting out the vineyards, then it is quite scattered and small areas that are highly suitable have been chosen. Grapes are grown from Western Australia around Perth, which is clear on the, on the Western side, uh, down through along the Southern coast primarily, although some small production in Queensland, the tropical uh, Northeastern uh, province or state, I'm not sure, what do you say, state or province? State? Okay. The uh, South Australia is the biggest producer and the most important, and Adelaide is the capital of South Australia and uh, the wine growing centers around Adelaide. New South Wales is uh, smaller and Victoria is smaller yet, with these other areas being quite small. Uh, their market has been important, uh, their export market has been important. Great Britain was the greatest consumer, but uh, is sliding behind Canada now and probably will continue to slide with the common market entrance. Uh, New Guinea, interestingly enough, is third in importance uh, and because of Australian population and European population. New Zealand is fourth and then US and Japan are small, but uh, perhaps uh, will grow as export markets for Australian wine. Their production, uh, older figures indicated uh, more than, well, only 22% uh, table wine, but uh, now it is shifting, and I suspect these figures are out of date. I expect it's more nearly half uh, today for table wine. You may know that after World War II, there were new Australians encouraged to come to Australia, many of whom were Europeans, some Yugoslavians, some Italians, and so forth. And this has uh, in, uh, contributed to the prosperity and shift in interest in Australia from beer toward wine. Their, their technology is excellent. Again, I think perhaps we've been overly complacent, and I would say uh, probably South Africa and Australia have been quicker to introduce new European ideas and ideas of their own, uh, perhaps, than we have been in recent years. So it behooves us to look to our laurels and uh, adapt what is worthwhile from their uh, technology as well as uh, help them with what may be new from us. New Zealand is very small. Uh, is, uh, and wine production. It is growing, and one of large American company has recently bought a winery there, and one of our current master's degree graduates is going to work in New Zealand, so perhaps we'll hear more about it uh, shortly. That leaves me five minutes to talk about all of South Africa, uh, South America, excuse me, and Mexico, which is going to push us a little bit, but not as much as you might think, because uh, I think it's a very coherent story and I can talk about them more or less in a group. If we're interested in volume, we should start with Argentina. Uh, 
If we're interested in history, we probably should start with Mexico because the thought is, or the, a belief is, that the grapevine was carried from Mexico to Peru and then spread from Peru to Chile and Argentina and the rest of South America. Uh, in any case, uh, the grapevine was introduced more or less simultaneously all over the Latin America with the influx of, uh, of the Spanish uh, um, conquerors of, of that area. Uh, around 1550, plus or minus a few years, is when the grapes were uh, first commercially planted in important amounts in most of this part of the world. Uh, then coming to Argentina, it is about the fifth largest producer of wine in the world, and certainly by all odds, the largest producer in the Western Hemisphere, or the Southern Hemisphere either for that matter. Uh, the industry is large. It's centered around Mendoza, which is directly west of, uh, directly east of Santiago, where the Chilean industry is centered. Uh, it is a high percentage of Italian uh, history in the population. Uh, and they have sort of the Italian attitude toward wine. In Argentina and the rest of Latin America, the industry is based largely, with the exception of Chile, which I'll come to, on a grape that we know as Mission, or a group of grapes that they know as Criolla. And the Criolla grape, or grapes, this would, could translate as native. They aren't native. They're European grapes, but they were introduced so long ago that they're considered native. In Chile, they call the same group of grapes pais, and here we call the one grape that we're familiar with, the mission, that fits into the grape that was brought by the immigrants from uh, Spain and uh, uh, Europe to colonize the new, new world. Uh, this grape is not found in Spain, and we don't really know, but we think it was probably a seedling. And then the further propagation and segregation into other cultivars has gone on since. Generally speaking, all of these grapes are relatively unsatisfactory, just as we've indicated for the Mission grape. Tend to be large berries making nondescript wine, which tends not to keep too well in hot weather, uh, tends to be flat, and so forth. So this has been a suppressive effect on the South Amer Latin American uh, industry, uh, is being changed because, uh, and has been changed to a degree because of the introduction of better varieties, but still is a problem in Argentina. So it's largely a bulk industry, mostly sold in, in bulk, uh, some bottled, uh, but uh, t with the Italian background. In other words, they have the general idea, we want wine, we want a good deal of it, but we don't care too much about uh, how high quality it is. Uh, it's, it's just as you wouldn't make a big deal out of buying Guernsey versus Holstein milk, I suppose, as long as you had plenty of milk. Well, they tend to think the same way about uh, wine, uh, having the Italian approach. Uh, they do have, in Argentina, the largest per capita consumption, and we have, again, an example of you make a lot of wine, you tend to drink a lot of wine. Uh, they don't have... Uh, very much export, but they are shifting. They do have a, a good research institute in Mendoza, and they are shifting toward uh, upgrading the quality of the wines, and they have upgraded the technology uh, by importing European advisors and uh, modernizing their industry. Chile, just across the mountains, is a long, thin country, about 150 miles wide and 3,000 miles long. And near Santiago, which is about in the middle, they produce excellent wines. And they have the edge, although they're second in production, they have the edge over the rest of, of the South American countries in that they have a French background. They have French varieties, they have the French approach to quality in winemaking, and they have good weather, at least in localized districts. So they are capable of producing a great deal of high quality table wine, and they do produce a good deal of high quality table wine. Unfortunately, due to uh, various problems, they have tended to overage the wine, at least from American export viewpoint, particularly the white wines. So the white wines, both in Chile and in Argentina, tend to be more sherry-like than uh, white table wine-like from our viewpoint. But they are well-aged. Some of the wineries produce bottle-aged products of considerable bottle age, and uh, the better wines from Chile are rather good, although seldom can be found uh, reliably outside of Chile. Uh, the major varieties in Chile are Merlot and Cabernet type uh, grapes for the reds and Semillon uh, and similar grapes for the whites. So again, the French background is shown. 
Uh, again, being in the southern hemisphere, the best wines are produced about in the middle, and as you go south, you become cooler and rather humid, so the grape production is less desirable, and as you go north, it gets hotter, so you produce brandy and the cheaper wines. Northern Chile and Peru uh, produce Pisco brandy, which is a white, unaged, muscat-flavored brandy. It's sort of a white lightning made with muscat grapes. It is uh, pleasant, uh, properly made. It can be very nice to drink. And it was exported to the uh, gold miners in California in 1848 in considerable volume. And the best drink in San Francisco at that time probably was Pisco Punch, which is made with citrus fruit uh, juice and uh, muscat-flavored brandy then from Peru, now perhaps from Chile, and not so widely sold today. Um, the Peruvian industry is very small. Brazil is something special for South America because being rather tropical and humid and a rather small industry, com uh, roughly two million gallons, I believe, uh, is uh, based on Le uh, Lebrusca-type varieties, particularly Isabella. And there is some effort to shift away from that, but as long as that's the case, they have some difficulties. Well, I'll not try to say anything about Mexico. I'll tell Dr. Amreen I didn't get to Mexico.